In Formula One's longest ever season, the sport returns to a happy hunting ground. It's the first time in five years that we find ourselves in the People's Republic of China here at the Shanghai International Circuit. And it is good to be back. Welcome, folks, to your weekend warm up from Shanghai. And welcome to the grid. Uh, guys, it's wonderful to be here. Welcome to you again, warm up folks with me and him and him. And he is Alex Brundle and he is Lawrence Barreto. Chaps, it's, it's great to be back in Shanghai, isn't it? Really great to be back. And it was great to hear the drivers already in the press conference recounting great memories of this place. It's a really interesting and technical track uh, and, and a challenging place to come racing. A cool place to be as well, isn't it? Yeah, I love it here. Uh, Lawrence, some fans will never have seen the Grand Prix of China. It's been five years since we were last here. Some of the drivers have never driven this circuit in their lives. Yeah, it's, a, it's going to be a phenomenal experience. Like Alex said, it's a great circuit. And what I'm excited about, it's going to be a sellout this weekend. We've got this enormous grandstand here straddling the main straight. With this place packed out on Sunday, all shouting for one man, Joe Guan Yu, it's going to be a phenomenal experience. Yeah, it really is. And of course, it's the first sprint of 2024. There's been a slight tweak to the format of a sprint weekend coming into this season. Your sprint qualifying is now on Friday after that single one hour of practice. Then we have the sprint itself on Saturday. Then we have Formula One qualifying. Then we have the Grand Prix on Sunday. Looking forward to that. Alex, this is a track you know like the back of your hand. You've raced here many, many times. You took me for some hot laps earlier today. Lost none of that sparkle, mate. That was a joy. Uh, plenty of laps, laps around here in a, uh, in a sports car. Catch those laps on the pre-race show. I think we, we had some fun. We used the full capacity of the brakes, didn't we? And, and more. And more. Um, I love this place. Y you really lean on that left front tyre here, get rid of a bit of downforce, high degradation track, very much medium speed, challenging in terms of the placement of the car uh, for the drivers. Certainly for you on the hot lap. It's certainly <laughs> an occasion for me on, on the hot lap. Um, but I think it's a track that's going to be a leveller for everyone. Uh, as you say, uh, only 13 of the drivers on the grid have uh, will have raced here last time uh, they were here in 2019. So they're going to have to get up to speed quickly on what is a, a limited practice schedule uh, here because of the sprint format. Uh, now, you can, of course, get in touch with the show. Hashtag F1 Live, as always. Um, a number of experienced drivers here, though. Uh, Lawrence, Fernando Alonso, one of them. Uh, of course, Lewis Hamilton, the most wins of any driver around this circuit. Six Grand Prix victories to his name. As Alex was saying, it is a huge challenge. Yeah, a huge challenge and, a, and an incredible one. I think Fernando Alonso was saying earlier it's one of his favourite tracks on, on the calendar and I think it's just because they enjoy it. You've got such a mix of corners here in such an incredible facility. And I think when we're looking at this year, Red Bull have been so dominant across the season already. But because it's front limited, it does feel like Ferrari might be in the game a little bit and, and maybe dragging the field together. And that might mean we could get some good racing all the way through the field. I think there's three three overtaking spots around here as well. Uh, two DRS zones. So, so it's it kind of is all set for quite a great sprint and an even better Grand Prix. Uh, talking about great Grand Prix, Alex Brundle, you're back in the team. That means you have something to do. It is the 60 second recap. Are you ready? I am ready. Then go. Then go. And the Japanese Grand Prix was go uh, when the five lights went out. But then it was relatively quickly stopped because Alex Alvin made contact with Daniel Ricciardo down at turn three. Both of them finding the wall as uh, Ricciardo came across the road. Alvin uh, on the outside, both, of course, out of the race, adding to Williams' issues. They got back underway again. And Yuki Tsunoda put in some incredible overtakes around the outside of turn six. It was quite the day for the hometown hero. Not a day for Lewis Hamilton, though. He was on a very long strategy in the Mercedes really struggling. Logan Sargent also struggling with Degna too. Had to reverse that Williams, unbelievably, back onto the racetrack. Managed to get it going again with only minor gravel uh, left on the circuit. Ferrari ran two different strategies, which meant a lot of pass and repass between the two teammates on what was a relatively strong day, but not as strong as Melbourne. George Russell would make the move around the outside, but eventually finish behind Lando Norris. Uh, down in turn one. And uh, in the end, though, the Red Bull just had too much pace. Despite not leading every lap of the race, they had too much pace for everyone else. Max Verstappen was happy and happy as well was Yuki Tsunoda, who got points on his home race. Big points. Big points. For Yuki Tsunoda. Look at that sun setting here. Absolutely beautiful. And as I said at the top of the show, longest season Formula One has ever had 24 races. Confirmation in the week, there will be 24 races next year. We start in Australia, we finish in Abu Dhabi, everything else in between. Uh, 
great looking calendar, Lawrence. Nice to be back starting the season in Australia as well. Yeah, I think there's going to be super good vibes there. It's always back to school feeling in Australia, and this time it's actually going to be back to school when we're there. But nice little calendar flow, I think, towards the back end of the year. There's a nice gap in July, a couple of weeks there. Obviously, continue the summer break in August as well. So nice respite, I think, for the teams as well. So yeah. Kept in Japan in the cherry blossom season because it looked beautiful yeah, it last this year. So I think it's great that that's in position as well. So, and of course, Vegas is going to be the only Saturday night race now that Bahrain and Saudi move back to Sunday races next year. Indeed, they will be. Other news to bring you during the week. Fernando Alonso. Alex has signed an extended contract which will keep him at Aston Martin for the next two years with a potential continuation beyond that to stay part of the team. Do we think that might be management? Do we think that might be world endurance? Did he, did he have options in a Formula One car? That's, that's the, the, the main question. Uh, yeah, they've got a World Endurance Championship program coming with a Valkyrie hypercar. Fernando Alonso, I don't think, thinks that far ahead. <laughs> uh, I, I think he's uh, seeing the performance and potential at Aston Martin. I think he's seeing uh, a great place to potentially round out his Formula One career, and it's not too much of a bad place to be an ambassador once your Formula One career is over. Um, but, yeah, uh, I'm not sure he had too much option potentially for advancement either uh, too far up the grid. He will be racing in Formula One until he is four. 45, he was talking to the press today. I think, um, you know, the new regulations in 2026 is going to be a, um, a possibility for everyone to, um, yeah, to mix the cars a little bit and uh, have an opportunity. Um, obviously, we will be uh, with Honda. Uh, we will be the only team uh, with, with the power unit from Honda, which obviously it is a little bit different than being a customer engine uh, now with uh, with Mercedes. Uh, so hopefully we have a, a little bit of a, uh, an improvement there. Um, also, I think with Aramco, uh, the biofuels and sustainability that uh, will come into 2026, maybe we have a, a little bit of an opportunity there as well. And the team is just getting better and better. New facilities, new campus, new wind tunnel coming uh, uh, this summer. So, yeah, there are a lot of things in place to be a very powerful team in the future, and I wanted to be part of it. Uh, Fernando Alonso back with his GP2 engine uh, in 2026, back with Honda. But, Lawrence, a couple of weeks ago, it was Fernando himself who was walking around this paddock saying, I'm hot property. I'm a two-time world champion. Teams are going to be looking at me. He's chosen to stay with Aston. The prime seats at Mercedes, at Red Bull, are still open. So is that Fernando taking the decision out of the hands of those teams? Or have those teams already taken that decision out of Fernando's hands? I imagine it's a combination, but I think it's leaning towards they've taken it out of Fernando's hands. I think he would have explored those options. He's refused to name those teams, but you've mentioned Red Bull, you've mentioned Mercedes. Both of them. <laughs> those, were, those were the teams that he was talking to. Informally or not, he was exploring the options there because he wants to have a seat where he can go and win races or fight for races. It became clear for a number of reasons, you know, contract length, timing on when they wanted to make their decision. Red Bull aren't in a rush, Mercedes aren't in a rush. And Alonso knew he couldn't keep Aston Martin hanging about, especially when it was such a lucrative contract. And I mean that not just in terms of money, but like we've already said, so many opportunities. He could go into management if he wants to further down the line. He could basically do whatever he wants with Aston Martin. And that is a phenomenal opportunity that's very hard to turn down. He had to be quick, though, because there's another very fast Spaniard who needs a seat for next year. And if Carlos had signed before him, that would have taken a, another one uh, out of the mix. You say Mercedes uh, clearly not interested in Fernando Alonso. One driver we know they are interested in, Andrea Kimi Antonelli, has been testing for Mercedes in Austria this week. It was supposed to be a two-day test. It ended up being a one-day test because it snowed on the first day. Uh, in an old car, in the 21 car, he'll be driving the 22 car. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, an extended test program for him throughout the year, whether he races for Mercedes next year uh, or is placed with another team. It seems certain that Andrea Kimi Antonelli will be in Formula One in 2025. But what of Fernando Alonso's teammate, Lance Stroll? A question I put to him earlier today. Uh, we know Fernando's back with the team next year. We never know how long your contract is. Um, will Lance Stroll be back for Aston Martin next year in 2025? Time will tell. Um, oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of just thinking about China right now and uh, see what the future holds. You want to be back though, right? Yeah, we'll see what the future holds. It's China this weekend. We'll see. <laughs> it's not an absolute yes 
from Lance. I mean, obviously he's gonna he's gonna be there. We we heard today that they're gonna start contract negotiations soon. With Lance. Yeah, do we think no, there's, do we Lance think there's a, a short, a, surely a short think, conversation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Lance is gonna be there until twenty twenty six at the very least. I I'm not convinced. So that, that. seat's out. So that seat is out. That's done. Out. He's got the opportunity there to race there next year, see what the new regulations offer, and then go from there. Unless yeah. Max hits the nuclear button at Red Bull. But that's Formula One, right? That could happen at any time. Like Lando could get an offer from Red Bull. Like like we saw. He's with had Ari an offer from Red Bull. Mercedes. Another offer. Like yeah. those things can happen at any point. Those are freak. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> like I think at the minute it is locked out. I think. I think it's the it's the moment Lance says. I want to do something else yeah. is the only moment that he'll ever find himself not with yeah. an option at, uh, at Aston. Wither Carlos Sainz, because his options are shrinking. There is obviously the Red Bull seat, there's the Mercedes seat. Other than that, there's Williams, potentially Audi. But when we look at the Ferrari drivers at the moment, Carlos, I would say, inarguably doing the better job. Alex, how have you looked at his start to the season? I mean, obviously, it's been interrupted uh, from, from that illness he had. He came back famously from it. And I completely agree with you. And I think even his teammate agrees with that. Uh, and, he's, and he said so, um, that, that science is really performing. He's driving for his life, isn't he? He's driving for his career uh, at the moment at Ferrari, doing an exceptional job of it. Perhaps now he knows he won't be in that car uh, again next year an element of weight lifted from the shoulders despite the fact there's uncertainty um, and he's doing a tremendous job. Yeah, he said to me earlier today that his comfort in the car isn't because the car feels any different to how it has in years gone by. The car is still ostensibly the same car to drive. It's just more predictable. It's not catching him by surprise. Uh, Lawrence, Charles Leclerc, we are used to him being one of the best qualifiers in the field. He seems to have lost his grip on on qualifying seems to have lost the feel for the tires and yet we get into the grand prix and in japan absolutely had that feel back ferrari making two strategies working there how critical is that for them as a team to be able to show that 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 worked and that they've got on top of their tire woes well i think for Charles, he's always quite hard on himself i think when things go wrong and he was particularly tough on his qualifying form because like you said well he's that was always been his strength but i was talking to fred in japan and he didn't seem that worried he said it's little details get th things here and there in terms of the way that they're using their tyres, I think they're really encouraged across the board. Both Carlos and Charles generally feel like they can get more out of it. Deg doesn't seem to be so much of a problem. They seem to be controlling grain in pretty well like they did in Australia as well. These are all issues that seem to be perennial for Ferrari for many years. So I think generally speaking, the vibe there is is pretty confident. Yeah, positive. I think they should be really strong this weekend. This is a circuit, another one of those medium speed circuits that would suit the Ferrari generally. Um, and you saw them really, really strong back in Melbourne very similar nature of the racetrack here, switchbacks at slower speed. The interest here is it's very front limited, a little bit like Japan was. So there's always that question mark between if the Ferrari is strong because it's compliant or uh, if they'll suffer more with the front limited nature of the circuit here. So it's going to be interesting to see how this weekend plays out and if they're back absolutely in the hunt as we've seen them earlier in the season. What are your gut feelings about Mercedes this weekend? Because they had a better Japan. They came out of that saying, we've got more of an understanding of the car. Is it enough, though, to really take them to the front of that best of the rest pile? I think not here. Uh, I remember standing in the final sector at Melbourne and watching Lewis Hamilton wrestle mm. the rear of that Mercedes. I think they may well have the same issue here. Massively traction limited in some areas this circuit. Uh, they've been having issues with the traction of that car all year long, and I suspect we will see a very crossed up uh, pair of Mercedes drivers throughout this weekend, but we'll see throughout the weekend. Lawrence, uh, an important track in the history of Red Bull Racing, of course, that first victory coming here. And yet it's a track that Max Verstappen has never won at. His winning streak really started when we weren't racing here. Um, there's a number of things that we can talk about with Red Bull Racing. Let's start with their competitiveness this weekend. Do we expect them still to be the, the team to beat here? I think when you've got a car as good as the RB20, it's going to be good everywhere. And like Alex was saying about how Ferrari are closing the gap, yeah, they're closing the gap, maybe, but Red Bull are still the ones to beat. And I think that is going to be very difficult. Three one twos in four races this year. You've got Checo, who's particularly saying this year that he feels much more comfortable with yeah. the car, can get more out of the car from his personal level. When you've got those two drivers operating at that level, it must be a very compliant car, mustn't it? 
and you have Checo, as you said, doing a great job in the car at the moment. Is it enough of a job to hang on to that seat for next year when you've got a Carlos Sainz sniffing around? Yeah, when they're putting one, two performances together, you, I don't think you can argue with that. Checo clearly contributing, looks much more at home, specifically in race conditions. You know, throughout last year, they'd have these races where he would just descend and spiral further and further and further away from the pace. This year, OK, yeah, not a, a, a max attacking performance, but he's still best of the rest, at least, you know, in recent times in race conditions. Uh, and I don't think you can throw a driver out of the car uh, who's delivering those performances. Uh, let's move on to talking about McLaren, because the talk out of them coming into this weekend is that it's not going to be a particularly favourable one, Lawrence. Why is that? because it's all the long duration corners that they got here and McLaren are very open and honest that those corners are just their nemesis yeah. essentially and you can't just undo that you can't do anything that's going to change something work overnight they've conceded actually it's the kind of problem that might take more than a year to kind of dial out of the car so I think they're accepting that this is a circuit that is going to be difficult for them but what I would say is there have also been other races this year where they had expected it to be tough and they were actually slightly better than they were thinking so it might not be as bad as they were expecting uh, five points, the difference between Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri. Uh, how impressed have you been by both of those drivers this year? I think they've delivered the potential of the car um, th throughout the season. I, they, I don't understand the performance of McLaren. They seem to operate in very, very distinct windows. You know, Suzuka, you'd think uh, a circuit which they, where they would be absolutely excellent but where they they seem to run that really high downforce uh that high downforce profile circuit they really seem to struggle at lower speed uh, i don't think the issue there in terms of a, a potentially race winning performance is with the drivers i think it's with development of the car and they're still trying to understand their package having taken a, a small step back i think in comparison to where they were at the end of last year in the early phase of this season fascinating to see how a driver's words can be used in different ways by different outlets i saw the same lando quote today used for two different headlines one was norris says it will be a long time until they win again the other one saying norris says wins are possible uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh there we go uh oscar piastri uh was talking to the press and me uh a little bit earlier today on a circuit that he's never raced at before in the build-up to this race weekend, McLaren seem to have been playing down their chances. Why is that? Why does the team believe they're going to struggle this weekend? Um, we've not been great in slow corners for a while, and there's a lot of slow corners here. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, our, our strengths are kind of the, the high-speed stuff. There's not really any high-speed corners here. There's seven and eight, but that's about it. So... Um, We'll see. Uh, I mean, when we say we will struggle, I think it's you know it's been very close between sort of us, Mercedes, Aston. We've gotten close-ish to Ferrari a couple of times, but we might just slip a little bit further back in that this weekend. But so, so still a top ten expectation. Yeah, I, I think so. I think anything less than that, I think it's something's gone a bit wrong. Um, but yeah, maybe just not quite as competitive as what we've been in, in, say, the last two weekends. Uh, a track that you've not driven on in Formula One. How much are you looking forward to, to getting out there? Because it's a circuit that the other drivers seem to all enjoy their time on. Yeah, I mean, I, I walked it this morning or, or rode it very fashionably on a, uh, uh, one of just the higher bikes. It was bright yellow this morning, so I, I looked, yeah, amazing out there. But um, no, it looked cool. A lot of sort of unique corners, you know, turn one and two onto the back straight as well. Um, both corners that you don't really have anywhere else in the world. So, um, yeah, interesting to see what it's like. We've only got an hour to get used to it before uh, sprint qualifying, so it'll be exciting to see. And is that a leveller for the whole field, the fact that no one's driven this track in this generation of car? Um, yes and no. I think, you know, the, the guys that have been here a lot of times, um, they're going to have the experience regardless of what car they're in. Um, but, yeah, I think the fact that no one's been here for five years is certainly better than if we'd raced here two years ago um, and, and I hadn't so um, yeah I think it it is a bit of a benefit having that but at the same time I've only got an hour to, to get used to it so um, at least I'm not the only one in that boat this weekend. Good luck, mate. Thanks. Uh, 
And to really emphasize uh, that point, actually, we're, we're noticing a number of drivers, just while we're standing here uh, with this show, walking past us, running past us, cycling past us, all wanting to get a good look at this circuit because it has been such a long time. It is such a unique track. And Alex, as we discovered earlier today, going out on track, some differences here, a little bit to do with the track surface, but mostly to do with what they've done on the runoff, all of the AstroTurf taken away. Yeah, they've taken away all of the get-out-of-jail-free stuff on the outside of, of Turn 10, uh, on the outside of the final corner, which used to be a big track limits challenge, uh, and put in what I would call the spa solution, which is gravel uh, up next to the racetrack uh, and then run off behind that. I think that's really great, defining the edges of the racetrack here. We'll see how much of that gravel finds its way uh, onto the racing line. But for drivers coming here for the first time, like Piastri, it is going to be challenging. It is a, a tricky track to learn. And we'll see if they if they manage to get their head around it. It's a roller coaster. Such a great circuit. Uh, right, let's talk V Carb, as we have to call them. Um, v Carb had a wonderful day out in Japan with Yuki Tsunoda Lawrence. He'd scored all of their points so far this season. And in that tight battle where just a single point can make a difference, that early haul of seven points feels like a, a, a really massive uh, advantage, a massive result for them. Yeah, v -Carb in a really interesting spot at the minute because the pre-season chatter was, we're going to have a slow start, the big car, the big package is coming later in the season. And yet they seem to be the midfield team that really are getting the most bang for their buck in those races where, say, a Lance Stroll maybe isn't performing or one of those like P9, P10s are kind of on the cards, on the tables. But particularly, Yuki is delivering a really strong performance I personally think he was strong all last year. I think he had a number of performances where that car wasn't quite up to scratch. He outperformed Nick DeVries. He outperformed Daniel Ricciardo to an extent as well. Like he did a really good job last year and he's just carried that into this year. And the real interesting point from Japan for me was the way he dealt with the pressure. Like he had the weight of a nation and we've seen how nervous he's been in years gone by when he's done home races and he just got it done. And that car is operating at a very, very good level at the minute. Even with how well he was doing. The talk, certainly throughout testing and in the early part of the year, was that with Liam Lawson waiting in the wings, Yuki Tsunoda had five races ultimately to prove his value, prove his worth to the team, or they would initiate a switch. That couldn't be further from anyone's thoughts right now. Tsunoda doing an absolutely bang up job. The one driver everyone thought was safe was Daniel Ricciardo. He has had, undeniably, a horror show this year. Alex, he's got a new chassis this weekend. If things don't improve, where do the excuses then start to come from? Well, you know, you look at the cars that he's been in uh, and, you know, you, you wonder if it's the car, you wonder if it's the driving style, you wonder if it's the team setup. Maybe he just doesn't suit this set of, of regulations and that is where uh, the performance lies uh, for Ricardo. But yeah, from being the, the driver coming in with extremely high hopes for that team, being really the, the sort of old pro uh, that was going to come and uh, was going to come and lead the team forward he looks to be under pressure and i think pressure amplified by the performance of sonoda i completely agree we've stopped getting the radio messages haven't we the big yelly oh, the radio, ones. Me yeah. radio yeah. messages yeah. from sonoda and I've, i just haven't had them they've just been deleted from consciousness in some way and i think that demonstrates a sort of settling from him and the fact that he's not under pressure from across the garage uh, in such a way. Look at that mindset change from Bahrain and the hot-headedness in Bahrain, the little afters that he had with Daniel after the checkered flag, to where we're at now with the more mature, more rounded Yuki. It's been a, been a massive, massive change. A massive change here in China as well. 20 years ago, he was sat just down there as a fan now, Joe Guan Yu will start the Grand Prix of China. What a story for the homecoming kid. Having a home race is so special. Very important for myself, also for Formula One in China. Been, you know, growing a lot, but you need the driver making some history as well. This could be amazing. It's been a very emotional place for me just to be going back there finally for the first time this season. 
after watching other drivers having their home race. It's a little bit gutted, it wasn't happening the last few years, but uh, yeah, Gray is coming back. I've been at the Grand Prix from the very first Chinese Grand Prix back in 2004. I've been there every year since then. It's kind of the place where I had this dream, wanted to be, you know, one of the 20 drivers driving on the track. The ticket was sold out in 20 minutes. The whole track, my ground stand was sold out in four minutes. A lot of pressure, but it's going to be good. Formula One is go! It's good to be back. Lawrence, you very much have your finger on the pulse when it comes to the driver market. Yes, this is wonderful. Joe Guan Yu, homecoming hero here in China. But is this going to be his only opportunity to race at home? We know Carlos Sainz is potentially looking at Audi. We know they have a young driver in Zane Maloney in the wings who's leading the Formula 2 championship and is, is really backed uh, by Alan McNish, who has such strong links with Audi as well. Nico Hülkenberg sniffing around that seat. Both Bottas and Joe under massive pressure to hang on to their seats. I think that is one of the most sought after seats because Audi's coming on board in 2026. I think drivers can see the long-term potential. I think you're right. I think Carlos Sainz is top of their wish list. I think Nico Hülkenberg is P2 on that wish list. And it is down to Joe and Bottas now to go out on track and deliver results to try and convince Andreas Seidel, who's obviously the CEO, at, or will be the CEO of Audi, that they should stay. And if he, they can't do that, they need to prove to everyone else who's still got a seat on the grid that they can get a seat with them and they're strong enough to get that seat. But at the minute, Joe's got to focus on this weekend. Enjoy the whole atmosphere. Enjoy that 7,000 fans he's got in his own grandstand and the rest of the place that's going to be packed out and just see if he can get some points on the board because the driver market is so fluid at the minute. There are so many opportunities. And of course, Audi with links to this very circuit, a sponsor of this circuit. Audi, big news out here in China, so maybe, possibly. Who knows? Uh, F1 Fantasy coming your way this weekend and every weekend. Brundle needs to change his team. He hasn't swapped out Behrman since Saudi Arabia. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Joe Guan Yu has no. his own <laughs> league uh, this weekend, which is called the Shanghai Special, uh, I believe. So you can get in on, uh, on trying to race Joe uh, and his team too. So there you go. Get on the F1 Fantasy. How's your team looking? That's actually not looking too bad, considering. I'm not too far off Julian Palmer. You're ahead of me, I think. Laura is No, I can't me. be. I'm doing terribly. Am, am I still ahead of you? No, you can't. If There's absolutely no you bad 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 I think you're, you're only ahead of Valsecchi. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'll take it. That's it. That's absolutely it. Right. We arrive here in China, and one team will be breathing a huge sigh of relief, Alex, and that is Williams. A horrible start to the year. We believe almost $2 million worth of damage accrued by the team so far this year. But good news, they have two cars here this weekend. Yeah, they've got two chassis, they've got two opportunities to score points. But how much damage has already been done uh, for Williams? Interesting comments from James Fowles in the week that all of the damage they have had, all of the time they've lost, will cost them later on in the season. I asked Alex Albon that uh, just uh, a few hours ago. He thinks it's going to be less of an impact from the driver's seat. But, you know, looking at it from the from the boss's standpoint, he thinks they will see the impact in the development rates as we move into the mid-year. They'll be delighted, though, and both drivers are delighted to put that phase of the year behind them. Fantastic inadvertent segue, Brundle. Here is that Alex Albon interview. Alex, uh, first sprint race of the year and yeah. uh, a new track for, for a lot of the field uh, from a long time. A great opportunity to steal a result, perhaps. It is exactly that. I think um, I'm hoping some of the top teams are a little bit less uh, in favour and, and feel you know they need a bit more preparation. And that's where the smaller teams can capitalise on that. Um, we spent a lot of work in the simulator trying to make sure we're as ready as possible. There's only so much you can do around here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's, let's see what happens. A more difficult weekend uh, in Suzuka. How's your headspace in terms of bouncing back from, from the incident? Uh, how are you feeling coming into the weekend? Yeah, I mean, it, accidents happen. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't put, put too much, I didn't put too much effort or thought into, into, the, into the crash itself. Moving on into this weekend, obviously 
the main thing is just the work that's been done back at the factory um, to get the cars ready. The team have done a massive job to, to get all the parts um, ready for the weekend. And let's see, let's see how this one goes. I think, as you said, it's, a, it's an opportunity weekend, let's say. And um, we've got all the parts ready now to go racing. Uh, lovely stuff. Williams will have their third spare chassis uh, ready for Miami. They do, as we understand it, uh, have their new front wing, which they ran in Japan. They've been able to cobble new bits together, I would imagine, from all of the smashed bits that they had and uh, cobble that back together. So, yes, two chassis for Williams here. They will be running both cars. Right onto another team struggling this season, Alpine Lawrence. It has been a tough start for them, but Esteban Ocon has upgrades on his car this weekend, a new floor, uh, which he's very happy with. Yeah, I talked to Bruno Femin actually in the week between Japan and here, and he's very bullish about the team's chances. A, he said they're not for sale. B, said he's, he's confident that he can keep the drivers on board and convince them that it's the right project. C, he's convinced that the team can bounce back and kind of get back towards, firstly, that P4 and P5 and the constructors, and then start and change the big team. But obviously in the here and now, they're in a world of pain still, aren't they? Kind of fighting towards the back of that field. That new floor will be a boost to them. Ocon's performed the stronger of the two drivers, so he probably deserves to have the opportunity to test that new part. And he's making all the right noises at the moment, Esteban. You say Bruno wants to keep hold of both drivers. Alex, you spoke to Pierre Gasly earlier today very quickly. What was his response when you asked him about next year? Well, it was a very quick response, no comment. Yeah, but he, uh, but you know, I did ask him about the sprint weekend. Was there an opportunity to score points? Was there an opportunity there for him? And he kind of said to so many of the journalists asking him a relatively similar question for their various broadcasts. Yeah, but we need to be faster if we're going to do anything uh, in either races throughout the weekend. Uh, one team hoping for a bit more pace this weekend is Haas. And in a break with tradition, they haven't waited till later in the year to bring one major upgrade package. They've brought the parts as soon as they're ready, as soon as they're available. Everything in CFD and wind tunnel tells them that it will be an incremental increase, Lawrence. They were expecting just to have it on Kevin Magnussen's car, but that's not the case. No, it's a mega job from the team to get two packages out there, especially as you said, well, they've just not had the processes in place to do that in the past, in the whole 10 year history in the sport. It's a massive reset for the team since AO Komatsu's taken over from Gunter Steiner. It's impressive that they were in disarray effectively, weren't they, over the winter, and they seem to hit the season strongly, are one of the teams that when those points are available, they've been able to go and get them. They've worked together to do that. I think to bring those upgrades, the next question is, do they work? Yep. Do they correlate? Because they've really struggled with that over the last couple of years. And that's it. Those upgrades on both cars this weekend, only expected to be on one. Great job from Haas as they push to move up the field and get very much into that fight with V Carb. Right, folks, here's where you can catch everything this weekend in Shanghai on F1 TV. We start, of course, tomorrow with practice, the sole practice session of the weekend, which is coming along at 11.15 local time. Then it is sprint qualifying at 3.15 local time. The sprint itself takes place Saturday morning, 10.20 local time. Set your alarms for that if you are anywhere in the world other than China. Qualifying is at 2.30. The race itself coming your way on Sunday. The Lenovo Chinese Grand Prix. 2 p.m. local time. Uh, and that, folks, uh, is pretty much it for your weekend warm-up. I've got to say, I love this place. I love this track. If you can see in the background there, the first time I came to this track, the mud, the, the le level of the land, was up to the top of the uh, fences right there. They had to dig this far down to hit something solid. And none of those skyscrapers existed. That, that's the growth of 20 years. I absolutely adore this place. What are your predictions for this weekend? I think tough battle between Ferrari and Red Bull. I'm going to call Sainz uh, victory in the race. Verstappen second to Clefer. Nice. OK. Oh, I like that. I think Max is still going to edge the win, but I think we're going to get a good battle. I think we'll get maybe the battle we could have seen in Australia before Max's breaks kind of ended his race there. So I think Max is going to win. I think Carlos signs P2, and I think Checo, because he's on a good run of form now, I think he'll nab that final podium spot. I like that. I like that. I think I might go with Brundle. I might go for a Carlos win, a Max P2, and a Checo P3. 
Okay, so we're all much of a muchness. Much of muchness. Maybe we know what we're talking about, maybe we don't. Let's see. We're going to be wrong together. <laughs> the tally. The tally for the year is looking drastic. Right, that's it, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Join us for this Sprint Weekend, the first of 2024 here on F1 TV. But for now, from all of us here in Shanghai, that's your lot. It is a very warm goodbye. This is the Chinese Grand Prix. It's good to be back. Awesome job, guys.